Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're joined by Christine Kaur. Christine is the CEO of peoplecoach.com. Christine, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, Christine, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you've got a vast variety, a bit of background in terms of your career, so I'd love to learn more. So you can't see me because this is a podcast, but I am Chinese by background, although born here as my Australian accent and when I was going to school my two career paths were doctor or lawyer as every (laughs) every great first generation immigrant should be and I'm not quite sure whether it was lack of effort lack of desire or lack of competence i.e intelligence of whether but I didn't get into either of those courses what I did get into was an arts degree which at the time my father said, but you can't draw, why are you doing art? <laughs> uh, but, but what I did there, I did a major in psychology and criminology and I really, really loved it. I love the thought, well, I love the work around understanding what motivates people, what our obstacles are, you know, and what we can do to basically unleash our potential and be the best that we can be. I left university and I decided to take a year off and I fell into a role in marketing and I really found love there right because I really Mm -hmm. love the concept of of marketing marketing is like psychology but for brands it's about understanding motivators for people why they buy why they don't buy and oftentimes meeting some sort of need an emotional need a physical need and so I did that for, for many many years and and I worked for some great organizations I led teams but about 15 years in I saw a gap in the market with a with a girlfriend of mine where we were using recruitment agencies and we wondered how they made so much money and why they did what they did and we <laughs> so we saw a real gap you know that if sales and marketing people helped find jobs for sales and marketing people but also helped build sales and marketing teams wouldn't that be better and so we quit our jobs without really knowing how to run a recruitment business, not even know how to run a small business. And mm. we started that uh, started a business 20 years ago and that, still, that business still exists today. So really, really proud of that. But about 10 years ago, I guess what I transitioned to is while I was still doing recruitment and I still do re- recruitment, what I started to do is work with people on a one-on-one basis to actually help them understand what's driving them, you know, mm-hmm. how to build their career and ultimately how to build you know, better businesses. So how did, how did they become better leaders? Now, the issue with that was that I was making a huge amount of impact. I really enjoyed what I was doing. The businesses were thriving, you know, businesses I was working with were thriving, but I only got to work with the most senior people in organisations, which made sense because the way the cost models are for, for coaching. And no right or wrong judgment in this, but the reality is I mainly work with men. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, the leadership in this country is all driven predominantly by men and skewed that way and and, across the globe, basically. But correct. Yeah. And mainly mm-hmm. white Anglo-Saxon men, mm-hmm. right, of yes. a certain age. And I love men. Like one of those men is my husband. He's a white <laughs> Anglo-Saxon, you know, 45-year-old yes. plus man. I love them. But for me, it was like, well, if we are really going to ever have equality, diversity, innovation, mm-hmm. creativity, we've got to get the access of resources, not only at the most senior level, but throughout an organisation. And that really is where the concept of people coach came up. It was how do we democratise executive coaching so that it's accessible to all? And that's what I spent the last two years of my life doing. And what I've done is we believe we've codified the process of coaching. So we've created the opportunity for people to do exercises, to think about their career, to think about their leadership, to think about their development and how they can add value to Mm organisations. And through our platform and our processes, we can now deliver one-on-one coaching to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Interesting. So in the capacity of one-on-one coaching, are they involved with the coach through the process? They are involved with the coach. Okay. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, no, no. So... So mm-hmm. our exercise and our platform mm-hmm. help people create insight about themselves, yes. and help create awareness, I guess, and give them some technical skills. So the technical skills around, you know, especially because our target is emerging leader. 
on emerging okay. and developing leader, right? Mm -hmm. And to be a great leader, you need to have two parts. One part is the technical side. So are you a great marketing technician, accounting technician, you know, programmer? So that's the technical side. And that's where we spend most of our time. That's what you do at university. That's what your, you know, your organisation teaches you is how to be technically good at the function that you choose to be. Mm -hmm. But what actually makes you a great leader and a great business person is your is your other skills, your leadership skills, your ability to influence, your ability to lead, your ability to handle difficult situations and chaos, your ability to keep calm. Those are things that aren't necessarily taught. Yeah, and the they're soft the skills, things, aren't they? All right? the soft skills. How to yeah. communicate so that it lands. Mm -hmm. Not communicate in a way that I want to tell you, but in a, mm -hmm. in a way that you will hear me, right? So it's that stuff that we work on. Okay, get it. So from that perspective there, so... Being in the coaching realm, working with executive leaders, I'll, I'll, I'll diverge a little bit. What have you found has made big impacts with people? Is it, what's, is it their be thoughts, beliefs? What sort of holds people back when they're, they're in an organization in terms of making decisions or working with teams? What are some of the key factors there that definitely fear. people can fear? Okay, cool. Yep. And what right. is, so what... We are scared mm -hmm. that we look stupid. Mm -hmm. We are scared that we are <laughs> stupid. Yes. We're scared that we're going to embarrass ourselves. We're yeah. scared that someone's not going to like us. Mm -hmm. We're scared that we're going to be fired. We're scared that we'll never find a job again. We're fa fa scared that we're going to die, you know, um, without any money and won't be able to feed our children. Yeah, interesting. We're, fear mm -hmm. we're scared that we're going to be found out. Yep, and that's that's all fear-related. All fear. Yeah, everything all, all fear. fear. Everything. Mm -hmm. Everything okay. comes down to, mm -hmm. you know, the things that stop us Mm -hmm. Is fear, fear of the unknown, you know, lack of control, mm -hmm. and you know what will other people think of us? But actually, what we should be focusing on is what do we think of us? Because ultimately, what we think of us impacts us more than what other people think of us. Correct, unless you're focusing too much on the external factors Correct. and leaning on those, right? So that's yep. a from a coaching perspective, it's really about building an, uh, an awareness to that, one would imagine. Absolutely. It's yeah. all about building awareness. And so mm -hmm. why? So we, so we, our platform delivers some technical learning around those soft skills, so mm -hmm. how to have a courageous conversation or how to deal with ambiguity in the workplace or, you know, how to deal with a difficult person. So they're all the technical things that we share. We share models. We share mm -hmm. insights, et cetera. Ultimately, though, the work comes down to understanding not just what to do, but why you aren't doing it. We all know that, you know, when someone's being a bully, that we should all stand up and say that's not okay and that we should say it in a certain way. You can Google that. You can watch a podcast <laughs> right. on that. Hmm. But we still don't do it, right? We still let the bullies get away with doing what they're saying. We still let ourselves be bullied. So what what do we need to do to, to clear that obstacle and actually step forward? And mm -hmm. that's what the coach does. The coach helps you understand your limiting beliefs, your limiting habit, and then we work with you to unbundle those mm -hmm. and give you the capability and the confidence to step into it. So break it down a little bit. So working with an executive coach, really one-on-one, -on -one, intensive sort of coaching, how would you do that and operate that model? Would that be like a once a week, once a fortnight type model, once a month? Once a month, yeah. So our programs start from $99 per person per month, mm -hmm. which means, honestly, if you're an organisation, you could get yourself an executive, your team members, a coach for less than $1,200 a year. Yeah, which is quite palatable for any business, really. Absolutely. Small, and medium or large, right? And, mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they go up from there, of course, but, mm -hmm. but that's where we start and that mm -hmm. makes it accessible. And what we do with that program, it's every six weeks. So we do exercises, so you get... Mm -hmm two to four exercises that you do over that period and then every six weeks you have a coaching session okay. with but our other programs go from six weeks to every four weeks coaching sessions oh, so it's just more bringing it closer together basically correct in terms of how the programs work okay yeah. correct yeah, perfect all right i think this is a great initiative that you, you brought together because i've been involved in working with coaches for a number of years now they made a big impact to the way i think feel and focus on on business and life itself so having access for at that sort of price point for some people i think it's a great thing yeah to have those conversations because we can all get stuck in it get in our own way as i like to put it and yeah oh. in terms of yeah we do and that awareness is a big thing that sort of comes from working on yourself and with other people to help you open up those 
those little blind spots that you don't really see. Absolutely. And a coach is not your friend. Mm. They're not your partner. They care for you, but, you know, they don't love you like your partner does or your parents mm. do, right? So our role is not to tell you anything, actually. It's actually mm. it, our role is to listen to you, to play back what you're saying about yourself or, or the beliefs that you've got about yourself and help you understand what's blocking you. Right, and the thing because we're confidential, because we're objective. You have a coaching program with me. We might work together for twelve months or eighteen mm-hmm. months, and then at the end of that, you might think of me fondly, but we're not going to ring each other up and be friends. So mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't matter what you've said to me yes. over that period of time. I'm not there to judge you. I'm not there to go and tell everybody else at the barbecue what you said and embarrass you. There's none of that. Which, when you can be truly free and tell people what your concerns are, then you can work them out. Correct. It's an open conversation, right? And until you get to the point of being able to share openly, the coach is sort of limited in what they can do too. But you can, with good questioning, you can break that down. Let's not dive too much into coaching. Let's look at how you've productized this. So from, you've obviously put a bit of the technology behind the product and yep. how it all operates. You have an application from what I've seen. Tell us a bit about your thoughts and how you you got from executive coaching into planning out a development of a product which may serve and allow you to scale out your coaching model. Okay. So what I basically did was I broke down the process of coaching into bits to see what Mm. were the components and how could I create a process, a platform around that to deliver it. So the first part was, you know, where are the cost points? Where are the pain points? So one of the pain points was, physically driving to venues, right? So physically sitting in a room together, there's a cost involved with that. So one, let's make it digital. Let's make it, you know, remote coaching. So Mm -hmm. we do everything by Zoom. So we were COVID friendly before COVID. So that's number one. That took huge effort, huge cost out of the process. Number two, part of what a coach does is we question and we, we question, we poke, we probe to get insight about where a person sits and what they're thinking about. So what we did with there is we codified those questions in that process. So what you do as a coachee is that you do those exercises. You think about what's driving you, what blockages you've got, how you behave in this situation. You observe other people behaving like this in the the workplace, et cetera, et cetera, so that when you come to the coaching session, you're already pre-primed, we call that, right? Mm -hmm. So you've already got that insight. Which means when you work with the coach, it can we can focus in on exactly what the need is. Okay. Right. So, so you're that, pulling that out of them pre the session. Correct. Yep, correct. Makes sense. So that that's the second part, and the third part is we then we obviously we put a process to it. So we've got mm-hmm. you know the exercise. Then we've got the exercises are created to be short form, so under mm-hmm. sixty minutes on the job in the workplace, and then we have the coaching session. So that's okay. pretty much how it works. There's a bit of education um, through it. There's a bit of yeah. yep. answering questions in it, I'm gathering. and Absolutely. Survey. Absolutely. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Answering questions, mm-hmm. thinking about yourself, writing, you know, writing mm-hmm. things out, talking to people. And, you know, so the first way we start, so, and then it was how do I communicate? How do mm-hmm. I communicate easily? So our first MVP yes. was via Facebook Messenger. So okay. we created chatbot. We uh-huh. created exercise that we launched via Facebook. And I just thought that that was the smartest thing that we would, like, we were just going to, you know, be amazing because it was there, it's on your phone, it's accessible uh-huh. anytime. It's like Messenger, it's not a learnt behaviour. We use chatbot to say, hey, how are you, and send reminders and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, people love the coaching and they love the exercises. They hated it being on Facebook. Hated it. <laughs> hated it. it. Yeah. Hated. They probably thought it was being tracked. Yeah, well, the, well, a couple of, of things. Couple of things. And look, it was just at the time where all those issues came up with Facebook security, yeah. security right? Mm. So we had a few customers use it that were just, yep, yeah, sure, it's fine. It's on people's phones. It's their you know, issue. But then, then we had more customers saying, actually, no, we won't let mm. Facebook be used. So there, there was one issue. But from the individual's perspective, they were like, you know what? I work from this time to this time. And I don't want you sending messages to my private account Yes. on 5 o'clock. So one of our exercises was 
track your week. So all we did mm-hmm. on a Friday afternoon was send you a message going, how was your re- week? You know, like smiley face, like rate one to five. And they were like, hold on. By 4.30 on a Friday, I've logged off. Don't send me any messages at 5 o'clock. Even, <laughs> it, even if it is to say, how are you? I don't, like, I don't want to know about it, mm. which was really fascinating because me, I'm a workaholic. I'm over 50. So 5 o'clock is still working day for me. I was like, gee, that's late. That's early still. I've still got another three hours of working on a Friday. So it was really interesting, that piece, but, but also the way people use technology. Again, I technology is a continuum for me. I use Facebook for personal and for mm-hmm. business and blah, blah, blah. But people are very delineated about that. So that was really fascinating. And the whole chatbot thing, that did not work for us, which is interesting. Yeah, I, th- I think that comes from either if you're running your own business or if you work for someone else. It's very compartmentalized. When you're running your own business, your life and your work are the same. Um, no, uh, look. Like a lot of time is spent either thinking about your, your work you got different pressures and different thoughts as to being employed by someone else. So people like to compartmentalise their personal life and work. Well, I think there's part, I definitely think there's part of that. You know, I, I talk about when you own a business, you're a parent. When you're working for a business, you're an auntie or an uncle, right? You still love, you know, the business. You might still go over and above, but you don't love them as much as you love your own mm. children. That's reality, right? That's, that's a good so, way, a good analogy there to describe yeah, yeah. that, yeah. Mm. And so, and lots of aunties and uncles so lots of employees do go over and above, right? They do answer call, you know. And so when I'm saying that there were a percentage of people that were going, don't contact me at 5 o'clock on a Friday, there were also, like even now I can see there's lots of people still doing their exercise on a weekend, mm-hmm. you know. That, so I get messages. So our, our program is on demand. So we have people that do their coaching sessions at 8 o'clock at night or uh-huh. 10 o'clock on a Saturday. So I'm not saying that everybody employed doesn't, but all that it was just interesting that there was a, a delineation. And you can say, is it because you're an employee versus a founder or, or own your own business? You can say, is, is it because we are working with emerging leaders and developing leaders who are younger mm-hmm. that they actually have better work-life balance? Because here's the thing, me being proudly saying I'm a workaholic and you can get me at 8.30 on a Friday night is actually not a good thing. No, not really, is it? Right? <laughs> when you think about it, right? It's not. Yeah. And so I admire the, the younger mm-hmm. generation, you know, millennials, whatever you want to box you want to put yourself in, but actually mm-hmm. saying, you know what, at 6 o'clock or 5.30, I'm turning off my computer, I'm going for a walk, I'm going to chill out with my friends, I'm going to take the kids down the park, whatever you're going to do, that's okay. Like, I think uh, we boomers, or we're Xs, I'm an X, we pride ourselves on the stamina that we have to work all day and all night, mm. which is not a good thing. It's a different psychology, mindset, thought, totally. beliefs, striving, all different people. So it's, yeah, I think it's, but everyone's going to be different because you're going to have people that are emerging leaders that are, are working from 8 a, 7 a.m. to 8 at night now. Absolutely. Like, that's, have that. That's, that's a reality. You'll have a spectrum cool. across yeah. everything. And so that's why we make it on demand. That's mm-hmm. why everything, if you want to compartmentalize and put it on 10 o'clock on a Saturday, you can yeah. do that. So yeah. on demand, is do you still bring in customization for the users to be able to maybe track, for example, how you checked in on a Friday afternoon at five o'clock, that was for everybody when you began and you do you now allow the user to pick their check-in times or how do you do that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So you give so, them the ability to, ma- to manage that. Absolutely. They okay. can book their coaching sessions when they want. They can mm-hmm. do their exercises when they want. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Everything is on demand as they choose. Yeah. So once you got that feedback from that messenger bot, did that then give you like an MVP to version yes. two and start tweaking, change the yes. approach? So we moved it off Facebook Messenger and we've built our own platform. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's what we're using now. And so that platform is mobile first. It's a, you know, it's a mobile enabled web platform. And basically that's where we serve up all our information. Mm-hmm. So all our exercises are there, all our dashboards there. So, and you can, yeah, and you can use it wherever you want, right? So laptop, desktop, mobile, iPad, yep. wherever you are. Now, one of the, the questions I'll ask here is how pivotal has your experience been in coaching to delivering an application like this? Clearly, you've been in executive coaching, I think it was 10 years before you went down this path. Yep. You mentioned yep. Like, yes. That domain knowledge expertise, how pivotal was it for you to actually make a success of what now is people coach? Well, 
I don't know any different, but I'm going to say it was absolutely critical because I've built the platform mm -hmm. for me. So I've got two mindsets because I'm not a tech. I'm not technical by background or function. Yes. Right. So I'm not building something that I can build. No, you're I'm building you're something. for an outcome, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so and here's one of the best things of being a tech person, a non-tech person, is I don't, I'm not restricted about what can be done or what can't be done. I just mm. know what I want done. Mm. And then it's over to the tech person yeah. to decide what they do, what they can build or not, mm -hmm. right? And when I get told, oh, well, we don't have that or that's not how it's done, I'm like, well, I don't, well, okay, so it's not how it's done, but can it be done? <laughs> you know, it's so, because I don't care that it hasn't been done. Delivered. Yeah. But I want it done. So tell me yeah. how I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. So that so that's number one. And I, I think that's, and the way I've built it is from two lenses. One is a lens of a business person. So if my people were on this program, what information would I want mm -hmm. to be able to track, you know, engagement, impact, you know, return on investment? Mm -hmm. Two, if I'm a coachee, so I'm a person doing the exercises and doing it, what do I want? I want it easy. I want it all in one place. I want it, you know, flexible so I can do it on the train. You know, when we're allowed to catch trains or when we, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, you know train that's on that's the that's way that's home, that's right? That's and thirdly, as a coach. So coaches are not tech gurus. We're people that want a functional application that's intuitive that I can access my people and, and my program. I don't need fancy things. I don't, you know, I, I just need something really usable for me. So that's how it's been built. Okay, so now laying out that, you mentioned at the beginning of jumping into this, you started breaking down the, the processes and designing them. Now, how did you approach that and get that in your head in terms of thinking? Did you just document it out? Did you flow, flow it through? How did you do that in your own mind? Yeah, so I'm a person that loves and needs partnership. So mm -hmm. I work best in collaboration. So mm -hmm. the person that helped me build, one of, my, one of the investors, one of the people um, helped us build it, would actually talk me through and ask questions around how does this work, how does that work, mm. tell me about it. Because I can be a bit of stream of consciousness if you, yes. can, if you can hear me, right? So I can yeah. just keep going. So uh -huh. what he had to do was help me, as he says, codified that. Mm. So he coached you through, through the process, process basically. <laughs> well, he questioned me through the process, yeah. 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 Oh, in terms of, it's all about good questions when you're designing product. I think it's, you've landed on something that I think you did that well, clearly. You brought in yes. someone that could... You get it out of your head and probably ask the right questions that would get to a definite outcome and answer to what Correct. the product might be. So that's really important to have someone around you that can ask those questions. That person, what was their background, their thinking, and how were they involved with the business? So their background is startup and mm -hmm. not a tech background as in yep. a programmer, but the, mm -hmm. the business person on the tech side, if that makes sense. Yeah, the person absolutely. That, that absolutely does mm -hmm. what you just said, takes what the business needs are yes, and put them and is knows enough to be able to speak to the tech without doing the tech. Mm. Yep. The translation, translation point. Yep. Yep. And that's. And then from that point, how did you go about finding a team that could then deliver and implement those needs? Okay. So he, that, that's what he did. That was his background. And so we okay. used an outsourced organization to build that. Mm -hmm. We made that decision quite deliberately because when you use an organisation to do that, you can bring in all the different skills that's required for a fixed-term project. So you can bring in the user, usability person, you can bring in the brand person, you can bring in the project manager, you can bring in the tech programmer, you can bring different skills. Mm -hmm. If you build it in-house, although theoretically it may have been cheaper, it would have taken a lot longer, but we only would have had one skill set. And I truly believe, yeah. like I, I live what I believe, and that is diversity creates better outcomes. So having mixed groups of people, having debate, having disagreement, having, you know, agitation, that creates better outcomes. Whereas if you only have one person, even though it might have been inverted commas cheaper, then you've only got one way of thinking, mm -hmm. which I don't think leads to the best outcome. Especially when you're creating something and new and different. Yeah, that's a great approach to developing the yep. software. Because like I said, if you did bring in someone in-house, you would have one either very senior developer or one with a couple years experience because they would be cheaper. And then yeah, you've only got a developer's knowledge. There's no UI, no that's UX. Right. 
no, they might not have enough experience to understand the BD, the business development side, understand those requirements or offer suggestions Correct. and things like that. So, yeah, so that multi-talented team is very important, especially in the, or not just in the early stages, but in all stages of a software development project. All stages of business development. Mm. Which is what right. it is, right? It's, 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 this is a tool that serves yeah. your business. This that's is just a tool for the business. That's right. Mm. This, is, this is the enabler and this is the communication vehicle of our business. But it all, like, I've just had a CTO join us, which mm-hmm. is fantastic. So this Brilliant. is the first official CTO, right? And he was part of our strategy meeting. Mm-hmm. And I said, first strategy meeting, and I, I said to him afterwards, how'd you go? And he said, wow, everybody's so different, like so, so different. And we are. So the four people on the leadership team are completely different approaches. Functionally, we've got different experience, but just work-wise, you know, how we approach things, how we think about things. One is very much focused on what's the impact on the people. The other one's, you know, very focused on what's the impact on the customer. But, you know, and really different lenses that can sometimes cause conflict, right? Because what's best for a customer might not always be right. what's best for a coach or a participant, right? Correct. So... But having that healthy debate and always then coming back to our core purpose, mm-hmm. it, it means that we have that North Star or that true light or whatever you want to call it, and we can have that healthy debate and agitation to get to that one core purpose. I think you landed when you said about diversity, bringing diverse thinking to a project, to a business. Yeah. To anything in life, really, because no one has all the answers. And you, yeah, we can pretend that we do. <laughs> we can walk yeah. around with blinkers on, but no one knows everything. And I think you feed off each other in that environment. So you may have someone yeah, from a different lens thinking at, about the business and how the business model around the technology and someone thinking mm-hmm. about uh, just the tech and how it gets delivered. And then someone thinking about how is this impacting the actual user at the end of the, the piece of the puzzle. But then the coach, what's their impact? And I think you need all those conversations, all stakeholders to be thought about and discussed and questioned. But yeah, it's good to have someone that wears that hat because jumping in and out, you've always got, as a person standing there in a project, you've always got your own hat on. So for me, I lead from more of a business questioning. I understand looking at the business model, how that works, how it all comes together, how the technology is going to serve. And you've got Anthony that comes into a project looking at from perspective of, or how are we technically going to actually deliver this thing? Mm-hmm. So you need all those different hats to get good quality outcomes. 100% agree with that. Absolutely. In terms of the business itself, you mentioned you had some investors in it. How did you structure this? Is it a complete startup from scratch? How did you build the model of People Coach? As in, how did I bring investors in? No, how, did, you- how did, did, you, did you bring a team first? Did you bring advisors first? How did you approach getting this up and running? Well, I started it and then I brought in my first mm-hmm. partner, so Simon. He came in to really help do the questioning and the structuring as we had just discussed. Mm-hmm. And then what we realised, and I funded that. I funded all of that in the beginning. So it was okay. all self-funded. Mm-hmm. We actually had a first try at a recruitment matching platform before we went into coaching. And that, to be honest, built burnt a lot of our cash, and Ex- but it also gave us a whole lot of a little food. bit. So first try recruitment matching. So yeah. That. So the first actually the first yeah. business was called People Match. Oh, it wasn't People Coach. You yeah, pivoted. And, interesting. Yeah, yeah, we did pivot, yeah. and and what the the first crack at it was, mm-hmm. you know, how do we bring values into the, and goals yes. in, and motivations into the recruitment process. And uh-huh. that's what I do as a recruiter. Mm. So as a recruiter, I will say to you, Anthony, tell me about what really excites you, what's important to you, where do you want to be in two years, if your manager did this, blah, 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 right? And that's what I get paid for. So, you know, organisations pay me a lot of money mm-hmm. to not only deliver them a technical skill but also a behavioural skill and an attitude and a value mm-hmm. match. And so my first step was actually to to do that, to okay. bring a platform that could bring together people's technical skills, but also, you know, what their goals were, what if they want to work part-time, if they want to ultimately be a florist, all that sort of stuff. And it was difficult and basically, you know, the summary was every time we started to get that to start working, the, our clients would come back and say, but Chris, I just need your opinion. And what we realised oh. was that 
for us to get it to work, we would need a whole lot of money mm -hmm. and a whole lot of effort. And here's the interesting thing. I'm passionate about recruitment and I'm passionate about getting people into the right jobs, but I actually wasn't as passionate about building a recruitment business. I'd done that in the, like for 20 years, I've run mm -hmm. a recruitment business. I wasn't as excited about that. What I was getting to be really excited about was the coaching, the one-on-one -on -one impact. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. so th we pivoted for two reasons. One, from a passion perspective. And I remember sitting there and this sounds really harsh, but but basically my business partner and I sat there and we, and we both said, just not that excited about building a platform that's going to make organisations even more money and make people looking for a job work harder. <laughs> you know, like it was Which like... Which is fair enough if you can learn it. was like, have that realisation. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't motivating. Especially early but on. But now, when we say mm -hmm. our job is to make coaching accessible to everyone to benefit the individual and the organisation, mm. that's... That's what powerful that's impact you can that's, have, right? That's just... Mm. That's, yeah. yeah. So what that means, Making it that, what change. that means, right, if we work with you and you start to do your job better and you're happier, it doesn't just impact the organisation, which it will, mm -hmm. but it impacts your whole life. Like it makes you healthier, it makes you happier, it makes you a better father, brother, whatever you are, because you're happier in your work. Mm -hmm. And so we have immediate impact and that's motivating. So once we did that, you can hear that in your voice too. So yeah. when you're talking about the recruitment thing, it was like, ah, oh, this recruitment thing. But yeah, interesting that you yeah, found what you're really passionate about at the You've moment. You've got to right? find that. Mm. You've got to do that. And like one of our exercises is the skills passion matrix, mm -hmm. right? It's about what are you good at versus what do you love? Mm. Like I'm good at lots of things that I don't love. I'm great. Like my first job was 10 years. I, was, I got my first lot of long service leave being a dishwasher in a hospital. I'm really good at washing dishes really quick. I'm sure you don't love that. <laughs> right. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, right? And so it doesn't matter that I'm good at it. Uh -huh. I don't want to do it. Mm. And so you've got to really work on, and that's the scary part when we went back to the beginning. What What's scary? It's about what you love to do and pushing through. Like, to, hocking my house to invest in a business, in technology, when you're over 50, when 3% of women get any IT support or, you know, investment, where, you it's know, tough gig, young, isn't it? mm. it's tough, but I love it and I'm going to do it and I am doing it. But, and that's the fear that you've got to step through. Yes, you're coaching yourself through this, right? <laughs> totally. Yes, you're, you're I totally trip. coach myself through things. I absolutely feel the fear. I absolutely get concerned about my future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely I do. Stupid if you don't. Really, it's how you manage it. And it can drive you yeah. too. Does it stop you? Yeah, it so it can either freeze you and you can sit, sit down and freeze and you be stuck or you can use it to push you forward. And I think it depends how you utilize that energy in in the end. Yep. We can all get stuck, but yeah, yep. if you can just make that first step, it can get momentum moving and things can change pretty quickly. Yeah, that's just um, that's stepping right. into unknown is yeah pretty fearful for a lot of people out there. And it's, yeah but there's unknown all around us. And as we learn in 2020, change is inevitable. It's going to happen all the time. It's just how we deal Absolutely. with it, basically. Absolutely. Mm. And that's what we do. People Coach Help gives you the technical skills to do it, but also the support to partner you as you start to transition and make some of those decisions mm -hmm. yourself and move forward. And I think there's a lot of learning just talking to you around not only people, Coach, but what you did with People Match. Just there, yep. you've only you've glossed over it, but I think there's a lot of learning that people can take away from this conversation. One, find your passion. What are you actually passionate about? But two, take the feedback from your customers, which is what you got pretty quickly early on, yep. and the realization that yeah, this this is not going to work. So, I think that's really what was going to work. Mm. It would have worked. In fact, when I went to a tech mm -hmm. uh, tech event or whatever in, in LA, and I saw an organization that had very similar to, to what we had built with People Match. The interface wasn't as good. They had less customers than we had. They had less participant or co candidates on the platform. Their matching wasn't as good. And they'd raised $3 million in the US. Yeah, so there's obviously and a market there, right? There was a market there, right? Because it was take it's taking people and cost out of the recruitment process. So there was definitely a mm -hmm. need there. And it definitely would have been successful. 
the issue was, was I willing to put put the work in to, to make that happen? And I wasn't. Like, I live and breathe people coach. I really do. And it's not work to me. I think I go for a yeah. walk and I think about things and I don't have anything in my – sometimes I listen to podcasts, sometimes I don't. Uh-huh. But a lot of times I walk and I just look at the flowers and I'm thinking about things and things pop up. Mm-hmm. But they pop up because mm-hmm. I, it's, I live and breathe it. Yes, yeah, so you invested in it, right? So you invested in emotionally. Your Absolutely. passion is in it. Yeah, you're not pushing mm. yourself to do something that isn't yeah. returning anything so, to you. The financial reward isn't enough of a motivator no. for you. And I don't think you've mentioned financial reward do. once in this conversation. And that's, I think, in our journey, what I've noticed is a lot of people who count the dollars before they build and invest in a business generally are the ones that find it a little bit hard yards. When when things get tough, you really need yep. that passion and drive behind the business to keep moving. Cause so it's all not I'm going to say mm. to, about that is, mm. ladies out there, watch that. Watch that, right? Because you're right, I don't, and mm. women are worse than men. Mm. We don't necessarily think about the financial side of it yes. as well as we should, which is not an advantage. And one of my uh, investors actually said, Chris, if you don't start looking after yourself, mm-hmm. you'll just end up being like every other woman, making lots of white men lots of money. <laughs> Brilliant. So step up, ladies, and including me. I have made some financial mistakes out of mm-hmm. this. Yes. Absolutely, I have. They've cost me. I can I can hold my head high and say that I've got absolute integrity and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if I was a male, maybe if I was a different person, if I was a male, I would not be in the financial situation necessarily that I'm in. Interesting. So, right? So, yeah. So be really careful yeah. of that. Although it should not be your main driver, absolutely. No, but it needs to, to be, be your business. Literate. Correct. Yeah. You need to be. I'm literate, yeah. like, but I just, uh-huh. I'm a bit like, oh, yeah, but we're achieving this amazing thing. So mm-hmm. don't worry about it. Let's not worry about it. Let's not worry about mm. it. But actually, you've got to worry about it. Oh, you do? Because then you can't, if you, in reality, if you don't get that right. You cannot continue to serve and drive this Correct. business. If you, yep. you run out of money, you run out of cash and it closes down, who does that serve? And if you're that passionate about an outcome and delivering results. No, no I'm not even talking about that. So I've run businesses mm-hmm. for 20 years. So I know how to manage cash. I know how to manage a p and You know, it's not about, I know how to make money out of a business. I'm talking about the shareholding and the investment. Okay, so bringing moment. money in. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about that part. When you're negotiating for yourself, mm-hmm. and I see it in women all the time, mm. I see it, you know, whether it's investment in a business, whether it's negotiating for a pay rise, we don't do it. Yeah, interesting. We need to do it. Yeah, no, everyone needs to know their, know their worth and, and ask. Correct. Right? So, and ask. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, the correct. Worst thing they yep. can do is right. Correct. So, anyway. correct, correct, correct. No, that makes a lot of sense. So in terms of, take us through some of the key learnings that you've learned about taking a model from completely offline to online. So what are some of the things that you've learned during the experience of digitizing what is people coach? That's interesting. You can ask the question in a different way, which might give yeah. you um, a better way to th- phrase it. So if if you were to go back to Christine, who was about to start and walk into the people coach venture, what would you tell her to look out for along the journey in developing a technology-based business that has a bit of infrastructure serving your business model? Oh, that's so hard because I don't – the biggest mistake that I've made is with respect to the investment side, so the non-tech part of it. Okay. All right. So the technicals worked for you. You've been able to deliver well, the well, outcome. What mm-hmm. well, well, what I'm saying is probably, have we made some tech mistakes? Yes. Yes. Right? Have we – did we need to change our platform from Facebook Messenger to, mm. you know, what we're not – yes. Did we have to learn more with – you know, how to use chatbot or not use mm-hmm. chatbot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, all of that. Okay. But then none of them were like, holy cow, if I'd known that, I would have, mm-hmm. but we had to test and learn. Like, oh, mm-hmm. Simple thing. I'll give you yeah. a simple thing. We, our calendar booking system was time kit, not Calendly, right? So mm-hmm. we had to change it Yep. because time kit was painful. But that's not a big they're just more yeah, learning exactly. and experience. Learning and experience. It's, it's not you didn't have to scrap no, the whole system and rebuild no. it. Yeah. So that's no. a step ahead that a, a lot of people have gone through. A lot of people end up getting two, three versions of it because they've either picked the wrong team. Well, or they the walk into approach. it without knowing. But you had a measured yeah. approach from the outset and you Correct. had a certain outcome you needed. You knew you had to get diversity and get someone involved that can understand your business side and it translated to a technical mm-hmm. specification. Well, 
and then you got a diverse team involved to develop, deliver that and focus on it. I think that's, I think that's, the, that's the point, right? So the point is yeah. that when we had the choice way back when of going, well, I know me, I know what I want, just do it. We didn't do that. We hired a team that was quite expensive. We had, you know, I mean, our scoping session alone was $30,000, right? Yep. So, and at the time, as a startup, I was like, holy crap, you know, really? I already know what I want. Do I really need to pay you $30,000 to yep. tell you what I want when I already know it? I can write it in five minutes. But actually what that did is helped us define really some of the things that we had to focus and how we had to focus. So mm. we built the minimum viable out of that, you know, things you do, but we already know what stage two and stage three is going to look like. Mm-hmm. You built the roadmap. Yeah, so that was probably mm. the so critical I think, part yeah, of so the Yeah, so if I have learning then, if we go that way, it's being a startup means being frugal but not being cheap. <laughs> so what we're looking for is value yeah. for money. We're not looking for cheap, right? So value for money is you buy a good pair of shoes for two hundred dollars that's going to last you three years, versus you buy the ch- cheap pair of shoes for twenty two dollars that's going to last you a night, right? <laughs> you do not do that with your business, whether it's your tech team, your people, your lawyer, your accountant. You don't. You get value. You don't get cheap. And then, so the mistakes you said you've made, you've touched on a few times lightly on the investment and like ownership side. Is there anything you would change with like possibly the structures of your business or the way you approached it or the negotiation? Probably negotiation. Something from there? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. How did you approach raising capital? Was it going you know, to VCs, friends, family and no, in between? No. How did you approach it? You know, and again, mm-hmm. I'm going to say another mm-hmm. inappropriate thing. You know, it's just been fascinating mm-hmm. Men and women do work differently. They We shouldn't, but we do. So all my investors are men. Okay. And I think one of them I approached and asked a question, but the rest virtually came to me. Okay. It's all drawn to and you. The, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Like the idea. And this is where one of them said, Chris, if you're not careful, you're going to just end up making a whole lot of white old men lots of money, right? Mm-hmm. Because what was happening mm-hmm. is when – so I and all of these people, which is interesting, and this is where when we talk about reputation and who you are, your brand, mm-hmm. all these people I have known for over twenty years that have invested, except for one who invested that I know I've only known him eight years, right? Okay, so you know but, them all quite well in some capacity. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So only one of them years. was my boss twenty something years ago. Yeah, okay. The other one used to work for me twenty something years ago, mm-hmm. right? And what would happen is I would talk to them about this. I'd say, this is what I'm thinking about. And this one, and I'd ask for help and I'd ask for feedback and I'd ask for perspective. And then, you know, one of them said, actually said, well, how else can I help you? And I was like, oh, well, you can introduce me to this or you can do this. And he's like, how about money? Do you need money? Mm. I'm like, yeah, sure. I always need money. What, what are you thinking? And he's like, I just want to back you. I just want to really back you. I want to be part of something. I want to back you. So that was one of my first investors. And my, the one that's just joined most recently uh-huh. is one of my coaches who has been doing coaching work. He's been introducing me to his friends who all happen to be in senior roles who have then said, this is amazing, this sounds great. This is exactly what my business needs. And this is where men and women are different. Men will do that with each other. As men were like, oh, no, she's my friend. My friend sits in my friend box. My business people sit in my business box. So we don't we don't mix them. Whereas men are like business and work all together, right? Mm-hmm. And friendship all together. And so then he said, Chris, this is going to take off. Everybody I talk to is saying it's amazing. I want to buy in. So that from my you know first into my most recent, that's pretty much how it's happened. Okay, so through your network, you basically and through contacts and people you've leaned on through the process of becoming yep. your investors, they get that. So yeah, yeah, they've seen you mm-hmm. being successful and saw the passion in what you're trying to approach, and then they, yeah, they, well, there's a couple of things they believed in what you're there's doing. There's a couple of things with the business, right? Mm-hmm. One, any business, anybody investing is going to look at it. Is the idea strong, right? So is there a need in the world for what I'm creating? And there is. Is there a unique way that we're delivering it? Yes, there is. Is there a technical capacity and competence there that we want to back this person, this team? I would imagine and really after this conversation. This person? Yes. Pardon? After this conversation, you can see what people are backing. And it's just, the team is generally the first thing and the people behind yeah. it. Is, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it do well. Do we trust the technical competence mm. of the person and the team? And do we trust the ethic mm-hmm. of the person and the team? 
And that's, I mean, put it this way, we had one legal agreement and we, you know, you're going backwards and forwards around, you know, if somebody doesn't do the right thing, if blah, blah, blah. And one of the shareholders said, oh, no, everyone's really good people. We don't need that one in there. <laughs> and I just went, no, we do, actually. Like, you have to work on the you have to work on the divorce settlement even if you're not getting divorced. We've got to do that. So we went to the lawyer. We got, but it was just, it was quite funny. It was like, no, we don't have to do that. We don't have to work. We don't have to plan if it doesn't work. And I'm like, yes, you do. Mm. And he said, it won't be a problem. I said, I know that. But you're still going to work for that. You're still going to have an agreement in there for that. Yeah, so, so everyone anyway. knows what happens. Yeah, I think. Yeah. You know, that's, it's been a brilliant conversation. Where is the platform at? So I see you see you're working with some reasonable brands. How have you rolled it out? Who do you recommend jumps on this platform and brings their employees to it? So you've got some big brands, obviously, you're working with. But who do you recommend that you can actually impact? Does it have to be big, big brands or could it nope. be? No. Nope. Yep. We have individuals yes. are buying it themselves okay. who want to boost their own career and they mm. want to you know, improve their capability, yes. especially in this new world that we're in, mm. where it's important to rely on yourself to drive your own career mm -hmm. pathway and your own development. Yes. It's cost effective. So you can get yourself a coach for $99 a month. Yeah, right? it so is that's cost double. effective. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So that, so we say, I mean, and this is, you know, whenever you talk to a VC or any, who's your target, it's everybody. <laughs> Anybody that wants to drive their career and any organisation that has people that are not at their full best full capacity. But is anyone ever at their best? Can't we, aren't we always improving, no. evolving? That's right. Yeah. But it's the point of time, right? Mm. And what are the things that you want to improve? Get it. So a coach is like a personal trainer in a way. Mm -hmm. It's you can't. You're not going to improve if you don't put the work in. Mm. So you need to be at a stage where you can actually focus on yourself and it's not a side hustle, right? So are you going to do the work? Like if you want to lose weight, you've got to go to the gym. You've got to watch your diet. You can't just buy the gym membership or pay the personal trainer and say, well, come on, it's your job now to lose my weight for me. You can't do that. You've got to do the work. So that's why when you're not ready and some people aren't ready because they can't, they can't be bothered. They don't want to. They've got other things going on mm -hmm. in their mind. Or they're really happy where they are and their focus needs to be on technical skills, right? So, no, hey, my leadership's okay, but really what I need to learn is better financial acumen. And so then I would say go off and do that. Mm -hmm. Go and do a, you know, finance for non-finance people course or something like that and spend your effort there. But, look, it's, it is for everybody. Our organisations that are coming to us are big and they're at scale because what they're seeing is that, People, we're gonna. Here's the reality. Moving forward, we're gonna have less people doing more work in greater uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So we need people that are technically strong, but we need people that are leadership strong, that know how to communicate, that know how to manage their stress, that know how to have courageous conversations and hold people accountable, that are confident in themselves and confident in being intuitive and taking some um, taking risks and getting over the fear and doing it anyway. And that's what a coach brings. So whether you, if you've got one person or five people in your team, if you've got 50,000 people in your team, we serve all of those people. How do you serve them all at that capacity? Can you scale? Do you, how many coaches do you need to really scale this thing? Give us an idea of the sort of numbers that you have on the platform. What happens if you had it? So every, each of our coaches can do mm -hmm. between 40 and 50 okay. yep. mm -hmm. participants. Mm -hmm. And I have a waiting list of coaches joining us. Okay. so you, We're doing another training. So we are scaled. Like if you said, I mean, literally I had a conversation yeah. with a client the other day and she said, we're thinking about 80 people. <laughs> That's, right, two sure. <laughs> That's two coaches. That's two coaches. It's fine. Yeah. Can be done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, the scale is 40 to 50. So it's, yeah, bringing on the coaches. In the world that we live in, there are some some good people out there with qualities and coaching backgrounds. But how do you vet, vet your coaches to ensure the quality? Ah. Interesting. Mm. Like everything, we have two parts of it. Mm -hmm. The first part is the technical skill. Yes. So what business experience have you got? Mm -hmm. What qualifications do you have? Mm -hmm. You know, what's your co coaching skills? So that's number one. And some of that's quite easy, right? You can mm -hmm. see a person's CV. You can talk to them about how they have they led teams, blah, blah, blah. The part that's most important to us is who are you? Mm. And what are you delivering? So the people that join us, they truly believe that they are coaches not just in job title but in the way they f think and feel. Okay. So it's it's a vocation, it's a passion, it's not just a job, mm -hmm. right? So they truly believe – they so, and they love it. They love the coaching practice 
they love serving the others and they love helping people become be the people that they want to be. And we spend a lot of time on the recruitment process internally, measuring their value set, their attitudes. And so we have a, like a process, we then put them through training, mm-hmm. we then we observe the coaching sessions. So we do a whole lot of work to make sure that they serve in the right way. Okay. So they need to be curious. Mm-hmm. They need to be inclusive. Mm-hmm. They need to be outcome driven. Mm-hmm. They need to be courageous and accountable and they need to love what they're doing. Uh, and I think you're obviously your, your recruitment background and being around people, yeah, psychology, absolutely. coaching background, it would make life a lot easier to find the right people to actually build and continue the brand. So yeah, your background is like, a, it's like a marriage made in heaven moving into this area where you've oh, got absolutely. everything covered, right? So and I, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it makes a lot of sense as to where you're headed and yeah, it'd be great to see where you're, where you're at in the next three to five years is um, your brand is quite interesting and the model that you've put together is compelling, I suppose, especially for businesses that are looking to grow, evolve and understand that your people are everything. And without great people and people that are learning and evolving with a business, you're going to be pretty stuck. And I think we've, yeah, everyone's learned a bit this year, but yeah, yes. there's nothing more important yeah. than our people. Absolutely. And look, you know, small businesses, mm. I mean, one of our smallest clients has got 10 people yep. in their team mm-hmm. and I've got four of them that are working with mm. us. So it makes it accessible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would. Yeah, no, I, I think it's um, a brilliant initiative and I can see the passion just streaming through you. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can see, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. And it just yeah, it comes through the conversation. So it's brilliant to see. And um, I would imagine you attract plenty of businesses to what you're up to. So, yeah, I wish you all the success with this because um, I'm sure you're adding a lot of value on the other end as well. Thank you very much. And to any of your listeners, if you are interested to trial us or put some of your team on, I'm happy to offer any of your businesses a 10% discount if they mention your podcast. Perfect. We'll let that know uh, through the And thanks for the first off of the podcast. <laughs> thanks for sharing that, Christine. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Christine, how can they do that? Just go to peoplecoach.com, which is P-E-E-P-L-C-O-A-C-H.com or chris at peoplecoach.com. Email me directly. Perfect, Chris. Thanks for joining us on the Dev Podcast. Really enjoyed learning your journey, your story, and a bit about what you're up to at People Coach. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. All the best. Bye.